myself included, and we said, with all of the innovations and technology, sometimes those are just, just become big distractions. But it, here's, there are great ways that technology can be used to, and to be able to glorify God. And I just thought of that today with regard to this family that needs help with so many, that there are ways through the use of technology to be able to reach out and help people that otherwise we would be, we would have a difficult time of doing so. So it's a, a great way to be able to do that. I'm going to remind you, spring forward next weekend. Wow. Spring forward, so that means we gain in our sleep, right? Or I was trying to think positive, even if I could like kid myself. So next, next, uh, next Sunday, March eighth, and uh, so um, we're gonna spring ahead, and uh, don't want to miss the service. So watch those times and watch those clocks. And uh, what's we got for the next slide, there, Jeffrey? Oh, next Sunday is our communion Sunday, and as usual on communion Sunday, we'll be sharing in our church family potluck. Letters, if your last name ends with letter A through M, it's the main dish and letters N through Z desserts or salads. So, uh, if you like my special treatment on that, salads. Make it fancy. So, and if you have any other questions about any of that, please see the pastor. Check with him. Yep, no, check with him. He'll really appreciate that. So, you gotta go see him. Let's stand as we worship together, praising God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for this time to praise you. We just give you all glory right now and all thanks and just to thank you for each person that's gathered together today. And we do it all in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise his name. Praise his name.
when words fail, Lord, that you still reveal yourself to us all around us. Help us to see you in your handiwork in nature, in people that we need to meet daily, Lord. I thank you for every opportunity to be able to recognize your glory and to recognize your majesty, Lord. We even do it here today. I thank you for each person that's assembled here today. And as Ron spoke up earlier, and no one is here by accident, Lord, I thank you for each one that's here for appointed purpose and reason. And you all praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, um, God's not dead. He's surely alive, right?
Mike, who's his voice here on earth? Gerard is one of his voice. So am I. So are you. We are his voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice through us. Praise the Lord. To God be the glory. To God.
Lord, to enjoy life everlasting with you, praising you, giving you glory. It is not so that we can proudly stand here in this space and just simply shout to each other that I know Christ. It's so that we can glorify you, not for our own glory. Lord, I thank you again for the, for the way you do bless us. And as we bring the tithe and offering, help us to recognize more and more with each and every day that this is, this is just a gift that, that from what you've already given us. That it is not ours to begin with, and yet you entrust it to us. You entrust us with so much, Lord. As Christians, help us to see, Lord, that we're not just uh, uh, walking about this world aimlessly, but we walk about with purpose and with hope and with, with a goal. And when you entrust us, Lord, I pray that we would be a people that truly looks to Christ for what we do with our time and what we do with our words and what we do with our resources. Here we come to you today, Lord. We say thank you for the gifts. We thank you. And we turn over to you a portion of that. And we say, we recognize as believers in Christ that Jesus loves me with a perfect love. Help us to emulate that. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's a new song. If you heard this on our uh, worship radio. It's from a recording by Chris Tomlin, but written by a number of people. Jesus loves me. Amen. Uh -huh. 
not sing this lightly. It is amazing that you love us. That Jesus was willing to do all that he did to purchase my salvation. To purchase the bride of Jesus Christ. Father, we want to show our love for you. Not because we can conjure it up on our own, but because you loved us first. We want to show you our love by how we live our lives, by our obedience to you, by doing what you ask us to do on a daily basis, by allowing Jesus to rule our lives as Lord and Savior. We pray in Christ's name. the vine, 
you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his, in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. What we want to be looking at today, and it's not rocket science as it were, but the fact that we give glory to God when we abide in Christ and bear much fruit. Okay? Now, please understand before we get into this, this is not a theology lesson about salvation. This is a lesson about producing fruit. Okay, that's the focus, that's the intent behind Jesus teaching this material here. So we're going to be breaking this down in a very unique way. You're probably looking at your sermon outline there and you're saying, pastor was really confused because these numbers don't all match up properly. No, there, there's an intentionality behind that because I'm, I'm looking at different focuses of the foci of these verses here. First of all, we're going to look at the source and the specialist for abiding. The source and the specialist for abiding. We see that in John chapter 15, verse 1, the last part of verse 2 and verse 3. Okay, you see how we're being confusing already? But just have your Bibles there and have your paper available so you can see it. Jesus gives in the Gospel of John seven different I am statements. And you all remember that when he says I am, he's letting everyone know that he is God. Remember when Moses said to God, who do I tell Pharaoh that you are? And God says to Pharaoh, tell them I am has sent you. Okay? This isn't a Popeye thing. This is a God thing. I am. So when he says I am, he's related to the fact that he is God. So Jesus is describing himself. He is the true God, not a God, which some cults would like to suggest that he is a God, according to John chapter 1. No, that's total heresy, because there you've got a predicate nominative, which means it's a verb of be. Anytime you have a verb of be, that means the. God. Okay? 2 plus 2 doesn't equal a 4. 2 plus 2 equals is 4. You've got your math problems. Remember the story problems that you love so much in school? Yeah, those are good fun times. Little simple things you can learn. If you see the word by, the preposition by, that means it's a division problem. Did you know that? It's a division problem. You see the preposition of, you know it's a multiplication problem. If you see any form of the verb be, that means it equals to. Okay? Wow. Cool. You didn't know you were coming from math, did you? <laughs> You've all just been homeschooled. <laughs> Not really. You get that in your place, right? So we see here that God is the true vine. I am the true vine. <clears throat> I'm not some person out there that's just trying to think that I'm going to convince you that I'm the source of life. He is the source of life. There are people out there that try to get individuals to think that you can get your strength from within. A lot of these self-help books being sold in even Christian bookstores. The seven things you can do, the ten things you can do, the twelve, it's usually the twelve things you can do because that makes a nice quarterly teaching, okay? But it's all these things. No, you can't. Our source, the true vine, comes from God alone. Or maybe you can tap into the horse. The life energy channel. Okay? There's, there's a lot of stuff out there that is just very, very dangerous. Be very careful. Or, you know what? If you give money to this cause, we've got you covered. That doesn't do it either. Or if you say the right words, 
Even if you say, in Jesus' name, there's nothing mystical or magical about it. Jesus says, I am the vine. In this context, if you want to make a difference for the kingdom of God, you need to understand that the source of all that you and I are is in Jesus Christ, the true vine. We also see that Jesus reminds the disciples that his father is the vine dresser. Some translations use the word gardener. In other words, he's the one who takes care of the garden and the vineyard. And, and what does a gardener do? You want to get maximum production. You don't want to set up a great amount of soil there and do all this other stuff for weeds. You want vegetables, fruit. And if you're a young person, candy bars. <laughs> you know, there's a marshmallow farm up here. Have you seen that? No, it's not really. But the children don't think that'd be great marshmallows. I don't want to see the bonfire that it goes with it, but it's, it's good stuff. The father wants the very best for his children. He doesn't want us producing weeds. He doesn't want us producing garbage. He doesn't just leave us to ourselves. He would be an absentee gardener. Uh, growing up, there was a couple of farmers in the county that my grandpa and dad called them pickup farmers. Do you know what a pickup farmer is? Someone who hires everyone else to do the work and just drives around in his pickup. They really didn't have a handle on what was going on because they weren't right there, hands on, doing the work themselves. He says, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Okay? So obviously, in order to produce fruit, the branch has to be grafted into the vine, the source. And if it's not grafted correctly into the source, you know, you can't do it with duct tape. You can't do it with contact cement. The vine actually has to have a slit cut into it, and the branch has to be put in there, and then it's wrapped around so that the branch becomes melded with the vine. Then the branch can produce fruit. The Christian is grafted into Christ. He is our source. Every Christian will bear fruit. Did you know that? Remember Charles Barkley years ago? I am not an example. He is an example. Maybe a bad example, but he was an example. Every Christian bears fruit. Do you bear a lot or do you bear a little? but you're going to bear fruit of some kind. So the specialist is going to help us to bear fruit. Because, you know, let's face it, have you been to some orchards where you get these little tiny apples? And the, the tree's just loaded with apples, but they're little tiny apples. Do you think that's good production? It's not. A good farmer, a good gardener, a good orchard keeper wants the big, juicy, sweet apples. That requires pruning. The grape clusters. You want the sweetest, the best grapes, and there are some that really know what they're doing about this. But it requires incredible pruning sometimes. So if you think, well, I can produce more fruit if I grunt harder, okay? you know, if I concentrate, <coughs> discipline myself, I can produce fruit. How's that working for you? <laughs> A lot of pain, isn't it? And not much production. So something has to happen so that you and I can produce the fruit. Well, the Father knows what to do. He created all of us fruits. He knows exactly what needs to be done in our lives. And so He gets to work and He prunes us so that we can bear more fruit. Now, I wish I had a, a picture here that could show you exactly what it would be like to do pruning uh, from some friends of ours in Ontario. We had a very good friend. He bought uh, an orchard that was kind of just dilapidated. And I, I'm looking at this, you know, as a grain farmer, and I'm going, wow, that looks really cool. And he goes, man, we got to do some major pruning on that thing. He says, come back next week and we'll be done with it. 
So I said, okay, Larry, I'll come back next week and we'll look at it. Came back next week, it looked like somebody had taken a helicopter, turned it upside down, and just buzzed that whole orchard. It was the ugliest orchard you have ever seen in your lives. And I said, Larry, what happened? Did you hire the wrong people? He goes, no, that's what we want. He says, you mark my word, next year our production is going to triple. It actually did better than that. But he knew what needed to be done to get rid of the stuff that was just taking up space, that was not producing as it should. Colin Cruz explains that pruning was an essential part of first century viticultural practices as it is today. The first pruning occurred in spring when vines were in flowering stage. This involved four operations. First, the removal of the growing tips of vigorous shoots so that they would not grow too rapidly. Number two, cutting off one or two feet from the end of growing shoots to prevent entire shoots being snapped off by the wind. Number three, the removal of some flower or grape clusters so that those left could produce more and better quality fruit. Now, that bothers me. I'm saying, but here's something that's for sure. It's flowering. It's, it's going to produce fruit. This is a good thing. And you cut it off. Number four, the removal of suckers that arose from below the ground or from the trunk and main branches so that the strength of the vine was not tapped by the suckers. Now, you, you, most of you have grown tomatoes, haven't you? And you know that you pinch off the suckers at the bottom, and that's the excess branches off the bottom. Because if you don't, you're going to have this big, fat, really full-looking tomato plant that's not going to produce these tomatoes. So you've got to prune it back. You have to trim it back. You are Bob the Tomato. <laughs> now, you hear that the gardener is coming to prune off some of the cousin branches, and you're thinking, that's got to hurt. It's going to be painful. You're right. A pruning is sometimes painful. Not always, but sometimes it is. If we are to be pruned, then it stands to reason that we're probably, and I'll make this spiritual connection here, we're probably attached to something or someone that is keeping us from better production. For many years, our family did not have a television set. Why? Not because we're Mennonite, but because we felt it was taking away from our spiritual growth. Now this was just in the days of air, air TV, you know, airways, no satellite, no cable. So what could it have been that was taking us away? Well, I was occupying my time relaxing rather than growing spiritually. I'm not saying TV is bad, but you know what's holding you back, what's keeping you from producing what you ought to be. And it may even be something that we're not even aware of in our lives, but our Heavenly Father knows. He knows exactly what it is. It might be something that hasn't become part of us yet, but He knows that if He allows it to grow, it will become part of us and will keep us from producing fruit as we ought to. You know, He's a specialist in fruit production. He knows what's going to bring glory to His name. And He knows exactly what is needed for us. And even though the, the pruning process may be incredibly painful, sometimes it may seem unbearable. We have to understand that the purpose is that we may bear more fruit, right? I, I know you, we could probably do a message on fruit, more fruit, much fruit, but I didn't want to do that. But the purpose is that we might do more. So I'm thinking, okay, this all sounds nice and spiritual. And John's writing this down here that, you know, there's pruning that might need to be done so that we might produce more fruit and much fruit. What's fruit? What's, I mean, I'm not going to produce an apple. What is spiritual fruit? And so I said, okay, let's look at the Bible and see what it says about fruit. Okay? Well, look at this. Galatians 5. Okay, let's look at this, shall we? It'll come up there eventually. Uh, Galatians 5. This probably is the first thing that comes to most of our minds, right? The fruit of the Spirit. Okay? Love, joy, peace, patience.
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's not fruits. It's fruit. It's fruit. Those are all aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. If we are abiding in Christ, these are character traits that should be part of who we are. How is your fruit production? Well, then you've got Hebrews 13, 15. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. We just did some of that, didn't we? In our singing time, we were offering up a sacrifice of praise. And by the way, I, I really appreciate, and I know the worship team does as well, when, when a new song is introduced, that you just don't go, I don't know this song, so I'm not going to do anything with it. You allow God to help you to understand the words, you pick up the melody, all of a sudden it becomes a sacrifice of praise to God. Well, you know, helping other people when they're in need, that's also a fruit. He says, therefore, Paul says, therefore, and this is in context of, he had just asked this group of people to send a donation to the church at Jerusalem, which was really, really struggling. And they did. He says, therefore, when I have finished this and I put my seal on this fruit of theirs, I will be on my way on my way of you to Spain. I will go on my way of you to Spain. So helping other people, that is fruit. Even as we talked this morning about this famine that has lost everything because of a fire. Those that will help and can help, that's fruit. That's fruit. And it gives glory not to you, but to God. We also see fruit as observed by others when they see us living holy, righteous lives because that honors God. Philippians 1, Paul says, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Where does it come from? Jesus, the true vine. Everything that we do that is righteous, that honors him, is fruit. Now, many of us think also of fruit as those who have heard the gospel message via us or others, and they come to Jesus Christ for salvation as Lord and Savior. They are fruit. Okay? Paul talks about the fruit of his ministry, talking about those who come to salvation. Because let's face it, you didn't save them. Did you? You didn't save them, but you were obedient, and you shared the Word, and the Spirit of God saved them through Jesus Christ. Then verse 3 reminds the disciples that they do already belong to Jesus. They're already grafted into the vine because of the Word that was spoken to them having success. We know this because they are already clean. Remember when Jesus was doing the foot washing there? And he says, you are clean, though not one of you, meaning Judas. They were all clean. How can you be clean unless you're born again? You can't be. And so they were clean. They belonged to Jesus. See, the only way to bear fruit is to belong to Jesus Christ. Oh, you can do a lot of good deeds. You can be very philanthropic. But without Jesus Christ, it does not bear fruit for eternity. All this, you know, I hear about these people that are connected to the occult and stuff like that, and they, all the wonderful things this organization does, that organization does. Let me tell you something, folks. It doesn't hold water in the kingdom of God. It's all of the flesh and of Satan himself. You see, he appears as an angel of light, doesn't he? And he does a lot of good things to make people think that they're good. It's Jesus. Only through Jesus Christ can anybody bear fruit. And regardless of what comes our way, no matter how painful or unbearable it may seem, the one who prunes us isn't trying to get rid of us, isn't trying to inflict pain upon us. 
He's trying to help us to bear more fruit. And we're always going to belong to him because of his effectual call on our lives with his word. Well, now we're going to go to the first part of verse 2 and to verse 6. And we see the separation of not abiding. The separation of not abiding. There are some who would suggest that the first part of verse 2 is dealing with someone losing their salvation, but in the context, that's impossible. And in the context of the totality of Scripture, it's impossible. What it seems here in this context is that Jesus is talking about someone who appears to be connected to him when he states, every branch in me. Okay? How is that possible? Well, we, we've talked about this in Hebrews and other passages where people have participated in the family of God. They have heard the word of God, but they don't belong to Jesus Christ. They've just gone through the motions. They've experienced what it means to be under that umbrella because they are part of a church meeting, but they're not part of a true church. But there seems to be, the reality is, this type of person doesn't match with the person who's been grafted into Jesus Christ. Okay? They live, they do differently than what a true branch of Christ is. Jesus is referring, I believe here, to the pseudo-Christian who does not bear fruit. Because remember, if you are grafted into Jesus Christ, you will bear fruit of some sort. You see that in vineyards. You see that in orchards. Even the branches that aren't producing properly, they will produce something. But here he's saying this, this person is not producing anything. Therefore, they're not grafted into the true vine. They're not just non-productive Christians. I, I know you might try to read into that, but please understand we interpret Scripture with Scripture, right? So if you want to say this is just a non-productive Christian, then Jesus is lying earlier because he says to the Father, I have not lost one of them you have given to me. If this means a person can lose their salvation, then Jesus can lose people. He can't. He can't. These people are trying to act as if they're connected to the true vine, and as a result, they're actually a detriment to the body of Christ. They bring shame and disgrace to Christ, who is the true vine. And as a result, the Father will remove that person. Where do I get this stuff? Remember his talking about the wheat and the tares? He says, don't mess with it. Leave it alone. I'll take care of it on the judgment day. I'll take care of it. See, you and I don't know the heart, do we? In fact, the Bible says I don't even know my own heart, so how am I going to know somebody else's heart? Who is the judge? Christ Jesus, it is he. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, it is he. He'll take care of it. I don't need to worry about whether or not you might be the one who's pretending. This is Christ's church. He's going to take care of it. What do I focus on? Abide in me. Abide in me. Produce fruit. <clears throat> Be obedient to him. Verse 6 is even clearer. These individuals do not abide or live in Christ because the word for abide carries the idea of remaining or continuing. So those who are not abiding or remaining or continuing in Jesus are not connected. Now you and I think of continuing like, okay, we started out, but we're not continuing. No, he's talking about from the very get-go. You weren't part of it. You weren't part of this. They may hang around the vineyard. They may be in the garden, pretend to be part of it. But because they've chosen not to abide in Christ, they're not in Christ. John talked about this later on in 1 John. If you continue to sin, if you have a lifestyle of sin, you make him out to be a liar. And the truth is not in you. Who's the truth? Jesus. He is not in you. If that's what's going on. 
So they're destined and doomed for destruction. Now there's always going to be those individuals who try to connect on their terms with Christ, but they don't really belong to Christ. I, I get so frustrated, some, and I shouldn't. I, I, I have to confess that I shouldn't get so upset about this. But there are these individuals who are pastors, who are interviewed, and they give such heretical comments that are totally against Scripture. I'm going, do they really think they're speaking for God? That's this person. Because when you say things that are contradictory to God's word, you're making him out to be a liar. You don't speak on behalf of God unless you speak using his word. Jesus spoke of them, like we said, the wheat and the tares. Remember the, the virgins? There were these foolish virgins, and they were not allowed to go to the celebration because they were not connected. They had the opportunity, but they weren't connected. The writer of Hebrews discusses them in a couple places, describing them as having received the word of truth, yet willfully continuing to sin. Jesus even uses the phrase about those that think they're getting to heaven, but they are on a broad, wide road that leads to hell, destruction. They think they're on the right road, but they've chosen their road. So do you understand how that fits together here? I think one of the clearest illustrations was in their own camp. Jesus is walking around, traveling, living with for three to three and a half years with this motley group of men. Twelve of them. The disciples had no clue that Judas wasn't one of them until after. Do you know that? Jesus knew, because Jesus knows the heart. But they didn't know. I mean, if you don't know that, you're in the very midst of it, how difficult do you think it is for us? <coughs> but don't sweat it. That's not what we're called to do, is look out for Judas, look out for Judas. No, 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 no. Look to Jesus, look to Jesus. Do what he asks you to do. Do what he tells you to do. He'll take care of the Judases. How do we know that? Well, let's go on to the next area. The superabundance from abiding. The superabundance. I don't know if that's a word, but I like it. And it starts with the letter S, so it works. The superabundance from abiding. There appears to be even more involved with that word abide. There seems to be an understanding that there is a direct connection between abiding and bearing fruit. There is a direct connection of abiding and bearing fruit, in particular, bearing much fruit. Now, obviously, we see the word abide or some form of the word sprinkled throughout this section. Actually, it's splattered throughout this section. Uh, you, you just see it over and over and over. So it's helpful to understand a little bit more about what it means. Wearsby gives a very wonderful definition to this. He says, it means to live in his word and pray, to obey his commandments, and to keep our lives clean through his word. That's the extra picture, more than just the abiding of being grafted. Now we have the abiding of drawing our sustenance and all that we are so that we can bear fruit from Jesus Christ. That's the picture here for abiding. Verse 4 lets it be known that it's impossible to bear any fruit unless we're tied in with Christ. Now that's obvious. I, I almost brought a stick over here. And just an old dry dead stick, and I thought, my hands are full and I'm lazy. <laughs> and I threw enough sticks in the boiler this morning, so you know, I but you know that stick, I can I can write apple on it, I can write grape on it, uh, I can write pear, I can have two sticks and write pear, P-A-I-R, P-E-A-R, because some of you know that I've just gotta do that. <laughs> you know what? It's not gonna bear any fruit. Not gonna bear any fruit at all. You and I cannot bear fruit unless we are connected to the vine. And the source is Jesus. And any fruit that I bear has to look like Jesus. If it looks like Leonard, it's 
scary, first of all, but it's, it's of the flesh. <coughs> Verse 5 makes it even more specific with the reminder that he is the source of all that we do. Without connection to the source, Jesus Christ, we can do nothing. But if we're truly connected to Christ, if we truly allow him lordship in our lives, not only can we bear fruit, but Jesus states that we will bear much fruit. I, I like how... Uh, they, they portray sometimes on MASH the uh, South Korean uh, people that they speak goodly English. You know, I see here we bear fruit, we're fruitier, and we're fruitiest. Fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. Folks, I don't know about you, but I want people to see Jesus in my life, and I want them to see much fruit. I don't want to just be, yeah, he's a Christian. He's a follower of Jesus. I want them to be amazed by Jesus. I need for him to produce much fruit in my life. Now verse 7 is one of those verses that when taken out of context of the totality of the scriptures, it's been wrongly misinterpreted to mean that whatever it is that you and I want, we just name it and God makes it happen. Really. How many of you have said, I'm done with snow? How's that working for you? God's in control. We sing that song again? <laughs> My God's not dead. He's surely alive. But the thing of it is, like so many passages of Scripture, when we want to understand what it teaches, and when we look at passages like this in particular, we have to understand it has to match up with what God wants. It's not what I want. It's not what I will. It's what God wants. It's what God wants. So when I ask for things, and if it's according to God's will, He's going to make it happen. For my benefit? No, for His glory. It's for His glory. This past week, I had a brother remind me that part of this is having a deep, abiding relationship where I know the mind of God and this brother shared with me that scripture memorization has made such a difference in his life. And we both about the same time said, Ah, your word I've hid in my heart so I might not sin against you. You see, if I'm not in the word, what am I tempted to do when temptation comes? To sin. Because I want to sin? Heaven forbid. But because... The world, the flesh, the devil, I seem to listen to, don't you? Not that I should, but we do. But we don't if we're listening to the voice of God because we're in his word regularly. The result of all this is seen in verse 8 as glory is brought to the Father. As we bear much fruit, God is glorified. And folks, as you and I bear much fruit, God is being glorified. That provides further evidence to everyone around us that we belong to God. And He is amazing. In this context, it shows that these remaining 11 are bearing much fruit. It's going to be obvious to the world that they're about to turn upside down that they belong to Jesus Christ. We want to now look at the significance of abiding, verses 9 through 11. Abiding is so important in so many aspects. Here Jesus encourages the disciples that his love for them <coughs> is the same as the Father's love for him. Isn't that amazing? Just as the Father has loved me, I have loved you also. And it's a perfect tense. In other words, it's not past. It's have and and will continue. I will love that. Greek language is so much fun. Because it just shows how incredibly thorough and complete and powerful the love of God is. Just abide in it. You see, if they do what God wants them to do, this will be evidence of the fact that they are abiding in Christ. It's no different than Jesus doing what the Father says. Because Peter says, hey, let's build three different booths here. Let's do all this. The brother says, hey, go show yourself now. No, Jesus did what the Father said to do. Okay? Jesus said what the Father said to do. 
That showed how much he loved him. You and I do what Jesus says to do. Why is it that Jesus spent so much time talking about fruit production and abiding? I look at verse 11, I'm going, I wonder if that might be part of it. If you look at verse 11, it says, These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you, and so that your joy may be made full. Isn't it wonderful when you produce fruit that glorifies Jesus? Don't you have joy when that happens? I mean, there's nothing wrong with recognizing, hey, I did what Jesus wanted me to do. Cool. You don't have to beat yourself up all the time. I, th I think Christians have a tendency to say, oh, that, uh, don't, don't look at me, don't look at me. That's just, that's just Jesus working through me. No, you were obedient. Give yourself a high five. Say, Lord, thanks for helping me to listen to you. Lord, thanks for helping me to do what I know I should be doing. There's nothing wrong. And brother and sister in Christ, there's nothing wrong with encouraging someone else that you see producing fruit. Hey, good apple. Man, that was amazing. You had a whole walk. Is watermelon a fruit or a vegetable? Honey, it doesn't matter. You know, you, you did this incredible thing there. Yes, I know some of you saying swirl. There he goes again. You know, but you did an incredible thing there. Because what does that do to the brother or sister whom you affirm? I says, hey, if they saw it, maybe somebody else did. This is good because Jesus is being glorified, right? But if you and I don't encourage other people, sometimes we don't always hear God's voice when he says, well done. Good faith, sir. We sometimes need to hear God the same on, don't we? Our brother and sister high-fiving us. Just don't miss them in their face. That's just all we ask. <laughs> this whole section deals with our relationship with Christ and the need to allow him to enable us to bear much fruit. And I, I, I see the reminder. We spent one out of four sections on it. That there are those who are like Judas. They look and try to act like Christians. But folks, God has that covered. He's the vine dresser. He sees the stuff that doesn't belong there. He knows what needs to be removed. We don't have to concern ourselves with that. What do we concern ourselves with? Well, I believe the application, the focus is to us. The more we surrender our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, abiding in Him, the greater the opportunity to bear much fruit. Right? The closer we are to Jesus, the more we'll recognize the situations that he presents to us where we can produce fruit. How do we do that? We spend time studying the Bible. We spend time praying. We spend time worshiping corporately together. We spend time encouraging one another in our walk with the Lord. We also spend time saying, God, help I need your wisdom. Just this last Thursday night, we talked about if anybody lacks wisdom, let them ask of God. And he will give generously without picking on you, upbraiding, putting you down. Just ask him. And where does he usually reveal it? In his word. With other brothers and sisters that use the word. We also see that sometimes, in order to make us more productive for God, there needs to be some pruning in our lives. Sometimes it involves taking out diseased parts that hinder our production. Sometimes it means removing some really good things. You know, there's, there's some things that I used to be involved with that were not bad, they were very good. But I saw that it was hindering me from maximum fruit production. And sometimes God says, I need to get that out of your life. It's good, but it's not the best. You don't want to produce the very best of the fruit. Let me take charge of your life. That's what God's saying. Ultimately, it will mean that God gets all the glory. That's really what it's all about, isn't it? 
the people would see Jesus in us and through us. So you and I give glory to God when we abide in Christ. And when we abide in Christ, we're able to bear much fruit. Let's stand as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we recognize that there's a lot of stuff that we sometimes involve ourselves in that is a distraction. And sometimes we can be on a roll and do really well in our abiding. Other times we get drawn on course. Lord, our desire is that we would give Jesus total control of our lives that he would be Lord of every area. And Father, where you need to prune, do so. Help us not to complain or whine, but help us to be still, allowing you to do your perfect work in our lives. Give us the ability to be obedient, taking the steps necessary to become stronger in Christ. And then, Father, when you provide the opportunity for us to bear fruit, then, Lord, let us be obedient. Give us joy, knowing that our service is for you. It's not for anybody else. It's for you. Father, continue to bless our day today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.